this world so bad that you must start all over? That you must sweep your creation away? Can't you fix us? Make us whole again? Of all the men on earth, what can I offer you? What can I lay at your feet that you would choose me? What makes me worthy of your salvation? How are we doing? Awesome. I want to say good morning to Building A as well and Southwest Campus. So glad you guys are here. If you have your Bibles, turn with me to Genesis chapter 6. Genesis chapter 6. Today we're starting the Noah story in Genesis. As I said before, Noah is one of my favorite Bible characters. Um, and we're going to have a good time with him. It, I'm still amazed that we tell the, the Noah story to children. This is not a kid's story. This is an horrific story story of mass capital punishment. It is a, it is a tough, tough story. And, and what we've done with it and what we do in our culture with tough truths from the Bibles, we'll take it and we'll kind of dumb it down a little bit. And so when we think about Noah, we think of the archie archie and the animals and, you know, and, and we forget of what's really happening in this story. That the world was so evil, the Bible says continuously with every thought and intention of every man's heart, that God basically looked at it and says, I'm starting over. And that those people died in this story. It, it, is a, it, is a, it is a powerful story. It's also a story of great hope and a story of great encouragement. That God always has a plan regardless of how evil someone may be or how you feel caught up in the backwash at times of someone else's sin. That God's always in charge. God always redeems. God always gives second, third, fourth, fifth, and multitude of chances. God always calls people to come to truth. God always extends love. God always extends grace. But there is an end to that at one point. And the point one day will be what the Bible calls judgment. Well, I don't know what you think about when you think of Noah. You probably think of a, a little small, round, rotund guy with a long beard. You know, maybe he's playing a flute. Maybe there's some giraffes around him or something. And, and we don't think of Noah the way, if I say Daniel or Paul or, or uh, Abraham, how would you think of them? And I always think of those guys as like 6'2", 6'3", just cut studs, you know, big arms. But not Noah. And yet the Bible shows just a different picture of Noah. This man has five chapters devoted to his life in the foundation of your Bible in the first 11 chapters of, your, of Genesis. This man has five chapters. The Bible talks about this man all over the place. Ezekiel, God's bringing judgment during the prophet time of Ezekiel. And he says, even if Daniel, Job, or Noah were standing before me, judgment would still come. I mean, God puts this man in very elite company in your Bible. Three of the four Gospels talks about Noah's life. Uh, Hebrews talks about him being a man of faith. Peter talks about him being a man of faith. And 2 Peter talks about his life was a condemnation to the world that he lived in. I mean, this man is, a, is, is an amazing man. And he, he's got to work through a very difficult situation, as we're going to see this morning. So let's start in chapter 6. I'm going to start in verse 5. The Lord saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth and that every intention of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. 6-5 is meant to contrast you with chapter 1 and 2 where God created all things and looked upon all things and he said everything is good. And about 1,600 years later, when, when that creation is placed in man's hands as a blessing of God to subdue the earth, to reproduce, to multiply, to bring honor and glory to God, God takes a, a retake, another look at it, and says, it's wicked. That's what we do with things if we're left to ourselves. That's what we do with things without God's intervention in our lives. 
It's what theologians call total depravity. And what you're going to see in this story is that creation obeys God, animals obey God, a few people like Noah obey God, but the majority of people don't. And so the resulting effect is it was a messed up world. I don't know if you've looked around. We live in a messed up world. Look at verse 6. And the Lord was sorry that he had made man on the earth, and it grieved him to his heart. I think this is one of the most painful verses in your Bible. I also think it's one of the most amazing verses in your Bible. I think most people think of God as a force or a concept or just kind of a shadowy, spirity figure somewhere up there. Do you ever think about what God feels? That God is emotion? You see, I think we live in this narcissistic society where it's all about what I feel, what my emotions are. I want to deal with my feelings. I need to bring my feelings out. I need to share my feelings. And, and I'm not against any of that. But does anyone ever take the time to stop and say, what does God feel? How does my sin affect the way God feels? And as it shows here that it breaks his heart. The New Testament says that when we sin, we grieve the Spirit of God. I want you to sit with that for a moment. When you sin, you hurt God's heart. And what's amazing about this text is God made us. He blessed us. He gave us the creation. He loved us. And he looks at us. He says, I am grieved that I made you. How bad would your kids have to be for you to look across the table and look them eyeball to eyeball and say, I am sorry that I ever brought you into this world. What you have done has grieved me to the point that I can no longer tolerate your existence anymore. Can you imagine? And guys, you need to understand in this text, God's a father and we're his kids, and that's exactly what he's saying. That there's something that grieves God's heart that makes his heart weep, if you will. Look at verse 7. So the Lord said, I will blot out man whom I have created from the face of the land, man and animals and creeping things and birds of the heavens, for I'm sorry that I have made them. So see, God is going to deal with sin. And, and, and you may look at this text and go, well, couldn't God wait a little longer? He waited 1,600 years. Couldn't God have given some more chances? He gave generation after generation after generation chances. Couldn't God have given them a good example so they would know what it looks like to walk with God? He gave them Enoch. And he did something in Enoch's life when he was 365 years old. He just took him so people would get it, so people would talk about it, so people would fall on their face and say, there is a God who's in total control of life and death and every detail of my life. You may look at this and say, that's just, this just isn't right. It's not fair. Well, that's because you're a sinner. <laughs> That's because I'm a sinner. You see, we, we are what I would like to call uh, selective hypocrites. Okay? We, we want justice for those who have transgressed us. We want mercy when we're the transgressor. And that's why, we, that's why I struggle with this text so much. Because I'm a hypocrite. I'm selectively hypocritical about I want God to take care of that guy, but I don't want God to take care of this guy. Verse 8, but Noah found favor in the eyes of the Lord. If verse 8 is not in your Bible, the Bible ends in the next chapter. But Noah found favor in the eyes of the Lord. Do you ever ask yourself, you know, why is Noah chosen? How many of you have been told that God chose Noah because Noah was a righteous man? I don't think that's it at all. I think Noah was a was a lug nut just like me. I think Noah was a normal guy who did normal things and just left to himself would be just as wicked. Left to himself that every thought and intention and attitude of his heart would go away from God just like mine will. It says that, look again, Noah found favor in the eyes of God. That word favor is the first time in your Bible where it, the Hebrew word means grace. That Noah found grace. Did Noah do anything to merit that grace? 
Did Noah do anything to behave well enough to earn that grace? No. The Bible lets you understand right off the bat in your Bibles that grace is a gift from God and you can't earn it lest anyone should boast. And so I think this guy is not picked by God because he's a little better than the other folks. I think this guy is picked by God because God had to pick somebody. I believe God looked at everybody and goes, you're all pathetic. <laughs> and I'm going to choose to love this pathetic one. Just like he did in my life. Just like he did in your life. We're all lug nuts. I don't think you believe that. I think we still believe that we're a little better than the average person. That's why God has blessed us the way he blesses us. I think that's an affront to his holiness. Because if you sin once, we are continually evil with every thought and intention that attitudes are all the time. If we sin one time. And God will not compromise his holiness. If God only loves the good guys, we're all in trouble. You see, I think people look at the Bible as God likes the good guys, and they're going to get on the boat, and the bad guys, they're going to have to tread some water for a long time and hold their breath. And, and the Bible's clear. Christianity is the only honest religion in the world. Christianity is the only religion, I don't consider it religion, but I'm putting that in that term. It's the only religion in the world that gives an answer to the sin problem. Every other religion in the world says you've got to get better, 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 better. Work harder, 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 harder. Religious, uh, Christianity says you'll never be good enough. You're evil in your heart. And everything you do is going to be evil unless I do a work in your life. Christianity is so honest and it's, it's the truth religion. And look at, the, look at the order here. Noah found favor. Then look at verse 9. These are the generations of Noah. Noah was a righteous man, blameless in his generation. Noah walked with God. Look at the order here. Noah finds favor, grace from God. And then it says he was a righteous man. He wasn't a righteous man, and then he earned the favor of God. He was granted the favor of God, and then he became a righteous man, and it says inwardly he was righteous. That means then his thoughts, instead of being evil continuously all the time, turn toward God and says, I want to be more like you. I want to follow you. I want to trust you. Where does that come from? It comes from the grace of God. I'll never do that. And so the favor comes, and then he is made righteous by the grace of God, and then he becomes blameless in his generation. Righteousness is the inside of the heart. Blamelessness is how people perceive you on the outside of your life. That when the non-Christians around him, and believe me, he was surrounded by non-Christians, would look at Noah, they go, that's a good guy. I think he's nuts, but that's a good guy. He loves his wife, he kisses his kids, he pays his bills. That guy will never speak badly about anyone. That is a good guy. And you see what God does. Here's what God does. He loves to take a normal lug nut like me and extend favor and grace to me and make me righteous because it's nothing I could have earned or achieved. It's something that has to be given. And then the righteousness and the grace of God makes me want to live in a blameless way because God has been so giving to me on the inside. I want to give that and live that on the outside. And then what he does, he takes a lug nut like me and you, and then he gives us incredible ministry to be a part of. And then we sit back and go, wow, look at me. I'm pretty spiritual. No, you're a lug nut. <laughs> and God does the work. That's why the Bible says that God loves to take the weak things of this world and do things only he can pull off. I've added that last part. He loves to take weak things like us. It's grace. At the birth of Jesus, and we're, we're going to see this in December, the birth of Jesus, the angels sing, glory to God in the highest and peace to earth upon people who his favor gives rest. That the grace comes from God. Christianity says all the guys are bad guys. God's a good God. And he has mercy on some. The question should not be, why did God choose Noah? The question should be, why did God choose you? <laughs> because God gave you favor. Anybody experienced the favor of God? I have. Anybody sitting there going, why me? <laughs> I know more about my past than anybody else in this room. Why me? 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 21 says, God made him who knew no sin to become sin so that we sinners might become the righteousness of God. Do you see the order? Folks, if, if, you're, if you're a visitor here and you attend a church and they say, here are the hoops you have to jump through to earn God's grace and favor, it's not biblical. And you can call it whatever denomination you want to call it. The gospel is Jesus plus nothing. Okay? 
It's not Jesus plus confession. It's not Jesus plus sacraments. It's not Jesus plus being a good little boy and good little girl. It's not Jesus plus praying these certain prayers. It's not Jesus plus giving this certain money. It is Jesus that he gives favor in our lives. And he looks at a lug nut like Noah and says, they're going to be talking about you thousands of years from now, not because you're smart, but because I'm good. He says he was blameless in his generation, and he walked with God. Noah's saying, God, I love you. Wherever you go, that's where I want to go. Whatever you say, that's what I want to believe. Whatever you want me to do, that's what I want to do. I believe you. I want to walk with you. Look at verse 11. Now the earth was corrupt in God's sight, and the earth was filled with violence. And God saw the earth, and behold, it was corrupt, for all flesh had corrupted their way on the earth. And God said to Noah, I have determined to make an end to all flesh, for the earth is filled with violence through them. Behold, I will destroy them with the earth. Guys, this, this is a tough text. People are killing each other. Mayhem is happening. Murder is happening. People have to start putting locks on the doors. They have to start uh, finding a police force. And guys, I want you to see here in this text, these folks aren't victims. It says they sin because of their flesh. These aren't victims. These are folks that understood, here's the tree of life. Here's the tree of death. Adam and Eve chose the tree of death. And everyone after them has to still opt the same option. And we all want to choose the tree of death as well. God says, do it this way. We say, we want to do it this way. These aren't victims. These are folks that say, I don't want to do it God's way. Our parents ran to death. Everyone since them has run to death. It says that God speaks to Noah. I always love it in the Bible when it says God speaks because people always say, well, God never speaks. God speaks all the time. Let me tell you how God primarily speaks to me right here through scripture. And see, I think some, some people want more of a mystical, exciting story to tell people. Well, God showed up and did this or God did this or that. Here's how God primarily speaks to me right here. And what, what I do is I'm in the word, I'm listening, I'm applying, I'm doing it, and God's speaking through his word. God's already spoken. You realize that, right? God's already spoken. It's up to us to do what God already says. And God speaks all the time. Frankly, I think, I think a lot of people just don't listen, to be real honest. We're, we're busy sinning, God's speaking. Matter of fact, Jesus says, my sheep, hear my voice and do what I say. Look at verse 14. Let's get to the boat. Make yourself an ark of gopher wood. That word ark, it's the only word, it's the only translation in your Bible of ark. Now the Hebrew word for ark is also used one other time in your Bible. It's used when, when Noah's mother places him in a basket, remember, and puts him in the, in the river. That word there in the Hebrew for basket is the same word here for ark, which is really amazing. Who would be the next redeemer, the savior, the leader of the Israelite nation? Moses. He was placed in his own little ark, if you will. And he went through the dangers of the water to lead a people to salvation, just like Noah's going to do. So he says, make yourself an ark of gopher wood. Make rooms in the ark and cover it inside and out with pitch. If you're going to build a boat, you want it to be watertight. Those, that, that word rooms there, the, the Hebrew word literally means nest. Little habitation places. Why? Because we're going to put some animals on this boat. Verse 15, this is how you are to make it. The length of the ark, 300 cubits. Its breadth, 50 cubits. And its height, 30 cubits. Make a roof for the ark and finish it to a cubit above and set the door of the ark on its side. Make it with lower, second, and third decks. I love how specific God is. I'm going to tell you what to do. Just do exactly what I say. This thing will float. And so if it, I've used the illustration before, but a cubit is basically from the top of your index finger to your elbow. It's about 18 inches. That's about what a cubit is. So, so this boat is 450 feet long, 150 yards. And this boat is 75 feet wide, 25 yards wide. This boat is 45 feet high or 15 yards high, has three decks, very stable. It, it'd be tough to capsize a boat like this. It was 1858 before another boat was built larger than this boat. This is a big boat and he's building it in the middle of the desert in the sunshine. What if God calls you to build a boat in the sunshine? Do you do it? This boat 
had 1.5, if you do the math around it, about 1.5 million cubic feet of space. It's the equivalent of 522 railroad cars today. Most scholars that I read believe that there were probably about 17 species, I'm sorry, 17,000 species of animals on the planet at this time. And they feel like you could have fit two of every kind of species in about 188 railroad cars. And this boat's about 522. Plenty of space for food, for family, and just to get away from the family members. <laughs> Three stories high, you're going to put a window up top, cubit high. What do you want in a boat with a bunch of animals? Ventilation. And so you got a window across the top. Some, some scholars have said that may be precedent, but three stories, it's a picture of the Trinity, the Father, Son, the Holy Spirit. It's what we did today. Matter of fact, the New Testament talks about baptism as the ark going through the waters of judgment, rising to a new day to walk on a new earth. And this man builds it. He says there's going to be one door. There's one way in, there's one way out. The New Testament comes along and Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, the life. Nobody comes to the heaven and the Father but by me. I'm the door, Jesus says. I am the door. He starts building this boat when he's 500 years old. He stops building when he's 600 years old. 100 years. Every day, getting up for 100 years. Putting his tool belt on. Waking his boys up. Let's go build the boat. 100 years. You know, we, we, we're like consistent with God for about two days. We're like, wow, I'm doing pretty well. hundred years. I mean, what if you get to about year 78 going, I'm sick of nails. <laughs> I'm sick of my sons. A hundred years. Hey, no, I got a plan for you the next hundred years. You're going to build a boat in a landlocked country. It's never had a flood. It's never got, a, some people think it's never rained at this point. And you're going to build a boat. How many jokes can people come up with about you building a boat for a hundred years? How many Noah jokes happened in a century? Every day for a hundred years. Here's what I believe Noah believed. I care more about what God says than what these people think. We heard it in the baptism testimony here in this building this morning. I care more about what God says than what people think. His present life was governed by a future promise. His present life was governed by a future promise is yours. Putting your faith in Christ today is the same as getting on this boat before one drop of rain falls out of the sky. It says, this is the place of refuge. This is the only place to run to. And we look at Noah now, we say, what a godly man. I think he was a freakish nut job who was building a boat. I think you and I would have walked by going, what a case. It says in 2 Peter that he was a preacher of righteousness. It says in Hebrews 11, verse 7, that he was preaching condemnation to the world. How was Noah preaching condemnation to the world? How was building a boat for 100 years preaching a sermon series? Hey, Noah, what are you doing there? Building a boat? Kind of big, isn't it? Yep. Why so big? Got to put some animals on it. How are you going to get the animals on it? Don't know. Where's the water going to come from? Don't know. It's going to flood. What's a flood? Don't know. <laughs> When's it going to happen? Don't know. How do you know, Noah? Because my granddaddy told me, and my daddy told me, and God told me, and I believe it. Govern your present life on a future promise. Are you building an ark? You see, Many of us worry about all this stuff and everything we accumulate, and you realize everything you have is going down, don't you? I love my house. I'm not putting my life on it. It's going down. I was talking to a friend the last week, and his wife painted when they build a new house in the driveway, it's going to burn. And it's just a reminder every day she drives in her driveway, it's going down. This isn't my identity. Are you building ark? See, I believe the New Testament is much more concerned with not what Noah built, but why he built it. That it was a condemnation to the world. Why was the world condemned by the building of this boat? What does that mean? Do you remember what Jesus said when he talked about his second coming? He used the Noah story when he talked about what it'll be like when he comes again. He says, just like in the days of Noah, there'll be eating and drinking and there'll be total obliviousness to the judgment that is about to come. Sound familiar? They'll be having parties. They'll be spending money. They'll be doing all this stuff. That's when he's going to come back. 
and they'll be totally oblivious. Why was it a condemnation? See, these folks are having their parties. They're being humanist. They're being secular humanist. They're accumulating. They're not thinking about poor people. They're just building more. They're not thinking about giving. They're thinking about indulging. They're not thinking about loving. They're thinking about giving. And for 100 years, that's what they hear. For 100 years. How annoying does that get? You're having your little Friday night party, getting a little sloshed. And out the corner of your eye, you see Noah out there beating on the boat. This man preached a, a message of condemnation for 100 years. People thought he was a nut job. Rhetorical question. How many of you believe that God is coming back and you'll stand before him on the judgment throne? And you see, most of us, if we claim to be believers, like, I totally believe that. Are you building an ark? You see, you can say you believe it, but if you're not building an ark, you really don't believe that. You really don't believe that we're going to give an answer for everything we do with every resource that God's ever given us. Your life should stand just as blatantly today in this culture as that ark did in the day of Noah. Look at verse 17. For behold, I will bring a flood of waters upon the earth to destroy all flesh in which is the breath of life under heaven. Everything that is on the earth shall die but I will establish my covenant with you and I shall come into the ark, you, your sons, your wife, your sons' wives with you. Don't you love that? I mean, everybody's going to die and it's a horrible story, but God says, but I'm going to save a few. The Bible says that broad is the path of destruction, narrow is the way of eternal life. He says here that I'm going to make a covenant with you. First time we see that word in your Bible. That word's going to be a theme throughout Genesis and throughout your Old Testament. To make a covenant means that God made us. That's the creation. We sin. That's the curse. God's answer is he's going to fix it. That's the covenant. That God's language for commitment and relationship with us has nothing to do with our behavior toward him because that's how good God is. Covenant's God's way of overcoming the curse and going back to the original intentions of I just want to bless you. And the human side of covenant is we walk with God. Look at verse 19. And of everything, of every living thing, of all flesh, you shall bring two of every sort into the ark, and to keep them alive with you, they shall be male and female. Of the birds according to their kinds, of the animals according to their kinds, of every creeping thing of the ground according to its kind, two of every sort shall come uh, into you to keep them alive. Also take with you every sort of food that is eaten and store it up. It shall serve as food for you and for them. How many of you ever wondered how did Noah get all these animals on the boat? Here's a couple of aardvarks, <laughs> a couple of snails. I think it's clear from that passage I just read that God brings the animals to the ark. Now I've, I've read different things. Some people believe that's when migration and hibernation started for the animal kingdom. I don't know. But I believe God brought these animals. These animals instinctively came to the place of refuge and salvation. Look at verse 22. It's an incredible verse. Noah did this. He did all that God commanded him. Noah did what? Everything God tells him to do. Now, was Noah a big fat sinner just like you and I? Yep. <laughs> but when God spoke, he did it. And it didn't matter how freakish it sounded. It didn't matter how the, what the odds were stacked against it. He says, if God says it's going to rain, he wants me to spend 100 years building a boat in the middle of a desert in a landlocked country, I'll do it. And that's why we're studying Noah today. Let's go to chapter 7. Verse 1, Then the Lord said to Noah, Go into the ark, you and all your household, for I have seen that you are righteous before me in this generation. Look at verse 4. For in seven days I will send rain on the earth, 40 days and 40 nights, and every living thing that I have made I will blot out from the face of the ground. Verse 5. And Noah did all that the Lord had commanded him. You ever watch a Noah movie, when do they start getting on the boat? When it starts raining. That's not what happened biblically. They get in the boat seven days before the first drop of rain comes. Why is that? In your Old Testament, when someone died, you would have a seven-day grieving period. Who do you think from our studies the last few weeks might have died seven days before the rains came? You remember old Methuselah? Remember the Hebrew name for Methuselah means when he dies, judgment comes? I think Noah's building this boat for 100 years, just keeping an eye on Methuselah. You taking your meds? <laughs> I'm not done yet. 
You're going to get us in trouble. You need to go take a few laps at the gym. And then I think old Methuselah goes on to be with the Lord. And they get on the boat and they grieve for seven days. And the, 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 the door of the boat at this seven-day juncture is open or closed? Open. This man's been preaching for 100 years for people to come to the place of refuge. Plenty of room on board. Come on. And I think the door stays open for seven more days. Warning anyone who would receive the glory and grace and mercy of God to come. Look at verse 6. Noah was 600 years old when the flood waters came upon the earth. And Noah and his sons and his wife and his sons' wives with him went to the ark to escape the waters of the flood of clean animals and animals that are not clean, of birds and of everything that creeps on the ground. Verse 10, and after seven days, the waters of the flood came upon the earth. Verse 11, in the 600th year of Noah's life, in the second month, on the 17th day of the month, on that day, all the fountains of the great deep burst forth and the windows of the heavens were open. People will say the Noah story is a myth, it's a fable, it's, it's folklore. You see how specific the Bible gets where it anticipates people won't believe? On this day, <laughs> this man in this place did this. It gives you all the specificities. The issue is not evidence, folks. You realize that Romans says it's not a matter of evidence. It's a matter of our hearts are darkened and we don't want there to be a God because we like being gods. <laughs> we like being in charge. And so this man gets on the boat because God had told him to get on the boat. Does this sound familiar to you from New Testament? That a person finds grace in the eyes of God. He's declared righteous publicly in front of that generation. And because of him being declared righteous, it gives him a sureness of a present judgment that's, or a future judgment that's going to come. And people hate him whenever he talks about that future judgment. And then that same man, because he wants to live this present life in view of a future promise, he's pleasing to God. He says to man, to men things that condemns that generation, and that generation responds in anger and wickedness. And just before the judgment comes, this man disappears, and he'll say, I'll come back, and I'll come back and start a new earth with you. Does that sound familiar? Noah is the Old Testament equivalent of Jesus in the New Testament. Look at a few more verses here with me. Let's go to verse 16. And those that entered, male and female of all flesh, went in as God had commanded him, and the Lord shut the door. You know something about this ark? Have you seen anything about a rudder, a navigation equipment, sails? No. The Bible says the waters, and we'll see it next week, rose the ark up. That ark goes wherever God wants it to go. Why? Because it's his ark, not Noah's. How many times as Christians do we try to put a sail on the cross or a rudder or a navigation tool? God, I know you want me to do this, but I just feel like I need to steer you over here a little bit because you might have missed up this time. These guys get in the boat, and then it says, look again at verse 16, and the Lord shut them in. The Lord shuts the door. I don't think Noah could have shut the door. I know I couldn't have. I, wanna, I want you to spend just a few minutes here with this little verse you think this is a sad day or a happy day for Noah? I think it's a sad day. I think some people might have seen Noah as kind of like, hey, I told you. <laughs> I think it's a very sad day. I think Noah's sitting in the boat with his family. He's looking out and he's seeing a niece over there and a nephew over there and a cousin over there and some kids from his kids' little league baseball team over there and a kid riding a skateboard over there. And I think his heart is breaking. And then God slowly shuts the door of the ark. As a preacher of righteousness, I think Noah was crying to the bitter end. Please repent. Please come on board. We built this for a reason. God wants to love you. Would you please trust God? And I think all he heard was mockery and laughter. And slowly the door shuts. The opportunity for repentance is over. Dear friends, one day you will die. Some of you have more years to live than others. The thing is, none of us know how long we're going to live. There is an end to the opportunity to repent of your sin and confess Jesus as Lord. The door shuts. They're in the ark. Everything God promised came to pass. And I think we live in a day not unlike Noah. 
In the day of Noah, the decree was sent out that in a lot of time, a judgment's going to come. Jesus Christ leaves and says, in a lot of time, judgment's going to come. We've been waiting 2,000 years for that judgment to come. He hasn't come yet. And people say, why? People think he doesn't exist. He hasn't come. It's been 2,000 years since he said all that. Because he's patient. He gave 1,600 years to that generation. Matter of fact, he told them, in 100 years, it's coming. Storm's coming. I'm going to let you watch a guy build a boat. And I'm going to tell you how it's going to end. Rain. No one got on. See, the issue, my friend, is not evidence. The issue is your heart. And I believe today that people look and say, God doesn't exist. Judgment's not real. And the Bible just says he's patient because he wants all men and women to come to know him, to be saved by grace, to make people righteous and blameless and holy in his sight. And just as the Father told Noah to build ark, folks, I believe in the New Testament, Jesus tells us to build church. I believe the ark of the New Testament is what the church should be, and the Old Testament is what the church should be in the New Testament. There's a place where the sons and daughters of God come and gather. And we remember the warning of a coming storm. And then we go and we preach messages of condemnation, of repentance, of confession, of grace, of mercy, and we beg the people we love to flee to the only place of refuge. And people think you're delusional too, by the way, don't they? You give your money, you give your time to this fable, this, fork, this folklore, this story. And we believe judgment's coming. I want you to stand there with Noah just for a minute. I want you to look out over the city of Austin and see people that don't know Christ that you love. It may be a family member, maybe a coworker, maybe someone sitting beside you right now. Maybe a kid riding your bike in the neighborhood when you go home. And a lot of these folks may not care anything about God. We are the ones who preach the message of God's grace and peace and the fact that there is a coming judgment. Your life has to be blameless, church, because if they don't see it in your life, where are they going to see the truth? Does this make sense? It's a convicting story. It's a sad story. It's a tough story. But it is a story of tremendous hope because God has given us, Austin Ridge Bible Church and so many others in the city, the opportunity to stand and be a living sermon in the city of Austin. Folks, there's a storm coming. There's a place of refuge. And all who flees to it will be saved. And no one else will be saved. That's what we preach. That's what we do. That's why we do church. Father, today we thank you for this text. It is a hard text to swallow. Father, I know just listening to this message is tough for so many because many of my friends in front of me and in Building D and Southwest, or Building A, Southwest Campus, they, they think about a mom, a dad, a brother, a sister, a cousin, a friend, a neighbor, a coworker that they know cares nothing about you. Lord, I lift these names up of people to you this morning that... So many hearts and minds have lifted up already in the midst of this sermon. We pray for these folks we love. We pray that you do a work through our lives that would allow us to show the righteousness that you've placed upon us based on your grace and faith and favor and so that we would live blamelessly in this culture. Father, I pray that you would continue to use Austin Ridge Bible Church to build ark. We believe you. We trust you. We thank you for your patience in our lives, in the lives of so many others that we love. And we pray that we would feel the urgency of a coming judgment. It's in the name of Jesus Christ we pray.